we're going to look at this verse up here. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So let's look at that from what the Bible tells us. There's two ideas floating about with this idea, and we'll come to them presently. So let's have a quick recap to see what's happening. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And those who are noting will see that the cross is like that, we suggest. Some people say it could be that way. But for the study we're doing today, it doesn't really matter. The point is there was three people on crosses. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. So both of those thieves on either side of Jesus reviled him. Both thieves did not believe in Jesus when Jesus was first on the cross. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. But one criminal changed his thinking while he hung on the cross. And this must have been because he saw the way Jesus conducted himself on the cross. He even said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He did not curse and have bad language or anything like that. He had concern for his mother in front, and he made provision for her. All the, uh, all the sky went dark, and many things happened, and he changed his mind. The soldiers mocked him at first, but after the resurrection, we read, so when the centurion and all those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. So everything surrounding the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the way he conducted himself instilled belief that he was the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is interesting because one of the criminals says these words. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, that's Jesus, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and, other, and us. But the other criminal answering rebuked him, saying, do not. You even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here's the verse we're going to look at. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So the sentence that we're going to look at is this. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So what is Jesus actually telling us in this verse? It's only a very small verse. What's he saying? Jesus assures the thief that he will be with Jesus in paradise. And we all agree with that, whoever, what, whichever religion we believe in. But what does Jesus not say? Jesus does not say that they or any part of them, like an immortal soul, for instance, was going to heaven. Jesus does not say that paradise is in heaven. So the main uncertainty of this verse is all around this word today. Does it relate to the first part 
of the sentence. And Jesus said unto him, Assuredly, I say unto you today, or does it relate to the second? That is to, uh, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, and then today you will be with me in paradise. Have you heard of this song by Dinah Washington? What difference a day makes? Or what difference a comma makes? Now, it's interesting to know that the manuscripts that we get the Bible from, especially for the young people, they didn't have any commas, punctuations, spaces, or anything. That's what we've got to remember. Can you read that, young people, there? It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because all the words in yellow are jumbled together. But that's the sentence we're looking at. And in the Greek language, it would be all like that together. So what happens is the translators try and make some sense of it. And normally they get it right. But on this occasion, we believe they haven't. So we'll look into this. So, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Or, and Jesus said unto him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That Rotherham says that. So notice, depending on where the comma goes, changes the sense of the sentence. The top one there, it says, the construction of the sentence implies that the very day Jesus said these words, that the Jesus and the thief would be in paradise together on that very same day. The construction of the second sentence Remember, there's no commas at all in the Greek, in the original language. This construction of the sentence implies the same, that Jesus and the thief would be in paradise together, but it would be an unknown point in the future. And that's what we believe the Bible teaches us. So we're going to have a look at this together. Today, you will be with me in paradise. So if we believe that, that very day, Jesus and the thief would be in paradise together. Let's see how that either makes sense or doesn't. So we'll assume this is the correct punctuation. Where did Jesus go that day after he died on the cross? Does anyone know what happened to him? can shout out if you want. Don't worry. You're a bit shy. All right. Don't worry. He said, today you will be with me in para paradise. And I know you're just a bit shy and bashful. That's all right. He went to a tomb, didn't they? They, they took the, 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 uh, the body down from the cross and they put it in this man's tomb. So... Therefore, paradise must be the grave then, because that's where Jesus went. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise if we believe it's that very day. Jesus was in the grave three days. So therefore, the thief would be as well. So does that make sense? It doesn't really, does it? I don't think. Also, a lot of people um, believe that the very second you die, some part of you goes up to heaven. And I used to believe that at one time until sh someone showed me this verse, John 3, verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven. We also read that in Acts chapter 2. There's no verses in the Bible that say we go to heaven. Jesus, after his resurrection, said, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. So this was after the resurrection 
it was still a future day that Jesus would ascend to heaven because he said, I haven't gone to my father yet. So he can't have gone to heaven the day he died. Jesus ascended to heaven on the 40th day. And the Bible does not say that paradise is heaven. Many believe we have an immortal soul. That means like a, like a ghost thing that goes up. Not our literal body, because the body was in the grave, wasn't it? You could have taken the stone away and you could have gone in and you'd seen Jesus' body there for three days. They think it continues after death. The Bible nowhere mentions an immortal soul. You will not find that. So let's look very briefly at what the soul means in the Bible. It's worth noting in the Hebrew, sometimes a word, the translators try and make it good for us, will use different words for the same Hebrew word. So if you've ever heard of something called Strong's Concordance, it tells you every single Hebrew and Greek word in the Bible with a number. And the number is H5315. And we first read in Genesis 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So the Bible does talk about a living soul. But look what Genesis 1, verse 24 says. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. You can see that's the same word. After his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So the soul means a living creature. But have you noticed that? The soul is a living creature. So every creature has got a soul. So it's not just humans, dogs, cats, zebras, goldfish, everything is a living soul or a living creature. So do they all go to heaven at death? Now, this, this is totally unusual. That's all it means is the soul is a living creature. And Ezekiel 18, verse 20 says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Genesis 3, verse 19 says, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's logical, isn't it? Jesus, sorry, God took uh, the earth, he made man, and then he breathed into him life, and he became a living soul. And when he dies, he goes back to the earth. So here's an equation for us. Dust and the breath of life from God equals a living creature or soul. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So when we sin, we will die eventually. So we return to the dust, the breath of life goes back to God, and we're a dead creature. So what's the death state? What happens when we die? The Bible says that in death there is no remembrance of you in the grave who will give you thanks. So the Bible's saying that we don't think, we're like, we're unconscious, like uh, when we're sleeping, but more. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So when we're dead, we don't praise God, and we're silent, we don't think. Now, isn't it interesting? It says heaven is God's, because we've said that no one has ascended to heaven, but God has given the earth to the children of men. So blessed is the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Because at one point I thought you went to heaven at death. And I couldn't understand this verse, how the meek were going to inherit the earth when we're going to heaven at death. And this is the answer. 
So death is a punishment for sin. That's interesting, isn't it? The Bible clearly says it's a punishment. So why would you go straight to heaven after death? It's a punishment. Souls are not immortal. They die. For the wages of sin is death. So to go to heaven at death would be an instant reward for doing something wrong, for sinning. That can't be right, can it? So let's look at it again, put in the comma in a different place. Again, there's no comma in the original. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. So today, the Greek word sem semeron, translated today, this day is used as a term of emphasis. It was like yesterday, there was a wedding and people made vows. It was an emphasis on that day. Acts 20 gives this emphasis. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God, we read. So clearly this day is an emphasis on when he spoke at that time. Paul had been speaking to the people for days before, days after, but he says, I'm going to tell you today, I've been talking about God's message. There's another emphasis here. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. But their minds were blinded for until this day, the same veil reads, uh, veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. See the emphasis that is put on this verse. There's a book called Rested Scriptures by Ron Abel. And many of what I've said today is in that book, and it's very good to read it. He says, I say unto you this day, <laughs> or it means I testify unto you this day. There are a large number of passages in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament in which the Greek construction corresponds to that of Luke 23. So I say to you, this day is the same as, it's emphatic and it means I testify unto you this day. An example of this is there, we'll just look at one. Therefore you shall keep the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which I command you today to observe them. Again, a term of emphasis. So let us assume this is the correct punctuation. Here's the term of uh, emphasis. And Jesus said unto him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So it's sometime future of when he's speaking. Where did Jesus go that day after he died on the cross? He went to the tomb. Matthew 12, verse 40 says this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It doesn't say he's in heaven, does it? It says he's in the earth, just like Jonah was in the belly of the big fish. Psalm 16, verse 10 says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. So Jesus actually went to a place called hell. Well, what do we think that means? 
Well, the Bible translators help us. If we look at that word hell, and in Strong's, it tells us. It's the grave 31 times, and it's hell 31 times, and pit three times. So the translators are telling us that hell, all it means is the grave. And we can see, if we look at uh, those who know Hebrew, tell us that Sheol, which is translated hell, means a covered place in the grave. The word hell originally conveyed no thought of heat or burning. It simply means a covered or concealed place. The Old English for helling potatoes means the farmer was going to go out and cover his potatoes. That's all it meant. It was to cover them. We wear a helmet, don't we? What does a helmet do? It literally means a covering for the head. It's got nothing to do with burning or fires or anything like that, is it? So a helmet covers the head. So we read these words here. I'll just pick it up at verse 34. It's talking about corruption. That means we go back to the earth where we came from. And it says, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, that's God raised up Jesus, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith, it also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Jesus didn't start to decay at all. He, he was in the tomb three days. <clears throat> Verse 36, for David, who was a man after God's own heart, he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption but he whom god raised again saw no corruption so all of us when we die we go back to the earth but not jesus he didn't corrupt like we do everyone sees corruption even wonderful king david with one exception the bible says in acts 10 verse 40 him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. So assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is paradise, isn't it? Those who overcome will eat of the tree of life, Revelation says, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The allusion to the Garden of Eden is unmistakable. The meek will inherit the earth. There was a curse on the earth, wasn't there? Thorns and thistles came up. Well, when Jesus comes back, the thorn and thistles will go, and there'll be lots of food in the earth, and it will be restored like it used to be. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And translators tell us that paradise is translated from the word paradisios, which Bullinger says was used by the Greeks to describe a large pleasure garden with trees or parks um, of an Eastern monarch. The word itself, therefore, is descriptive in a, an idyllic place on earth, not in heaven. You imagine Adam and Eve, can't you? When they were in the garden on earth it must have been lovely with all those animals and all with everything lovely no thistles or thorns and it would be like that again so where did jesus go the day he was crucified he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth three days later he rose from the earth again so we're just coming to the end now. So we read about the ascension and descension of Jesus from heaven. 
in Acts 1, verse 9 to 11, we read these words, don't we? You can think about Jesus. This is the Mount of Olives. It's also mentioned in the Old Testament in Zechariah 14, verse 4. In that day, his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives will cleave in two. So the Old Testament says the same thing. So when we come to Acts 1 and verse 9, Jesus was standing on the mountain and he went up into heaven. And the angel said, just like you've seen him go up there, he's going to come right back on the earth. So now we can understand about the reward of God, can't we? It was 40 days after he came out of the grave, he went to heaven. And he's there at God's right hand. No one else has ascended to God except the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's coming back very soon. So look at this, remember. The reward wasn't the day Jesus and the thief died. Because remember, we said that death is a punishment for sin. Why would they both go to heaven? Especially the thief. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong, of course. He died for us. But the thief, why would he go straight to heaven? He'd be rewarded then. Yet yeah, look what the Bible says. Matthew 16, verse 27, it says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And Revelation 22, verse 12, because there is one place in the Bible that Jesus says, sell everything and you'll have a reward in heaven. That's the nearest we read about a reward in heaven. But the point is, in Revelation 22, verse 12, it says, And behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So Jesus has got a reward in heaven, but when he comes back to the earth, then he'll give it to people. So Jesus is going to come back. He's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ haven't risen yet because Jesus hasn't come back. The Jesus, of, Jesus and the thief will be in paradise together in the very near future when Jesus returns to the earth. This is a lovely passage. It's very clear and it's lots of hope for us. Look at this. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For us in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So Jesus is the first person to rise from the dead to live forever. Because remember, there was other people who rose from the dead, wasn't there? But they died again. But Jesus is the only one to rise from the dead and live forever. And then when he comes, he's got a reward for other people. He's going to raise from the dead and give them eternal life at his, at his coming. So in the very near future, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, the curse of Eden will be removed from the earth. Earth will be restored again like a paradise, like it was in Eden. The dead will be resurrected, judged, and the faithful given eternal life, including the thief on the cross. And do you know the greatest proof of the resurrection is this? That tomb was empty on the third day. And you can read about that uh, in other books. So the empty grave is proof that Jesus rose from death. Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. It's not too late to truly repent like this 
thief on the cross. Six hours before, he was in the way of death. But because the way Jesus conducted himself on the cross, in that six hours, he realized his position. He realized this was the Son of God, and he had faith in him. What a marvelous thing that was for the thief. What a marvelous thing that was for the Lord Jesus Christ. In agony on the cross, and people, his disciples had forsaken him. Yet this one man, even while he was on the cross, believed and he saved him. What a wonderful thought that is. So thank you for listening.